In this lecture, we'll start looking at quantitative evaluation techniques and how these are used in user studies and as a method for proving whether something that you've created is better than uh, whatever you're comparing to. So let's take a look. I want to start by saying why are quantitative evaluation techniques important? Now, the data from user studies or any other source are a crucial part of everyday life. You're going to come across data and I want everyone in this class to be able to critically analyze that data and reflect on what results can really be gained from it. It's really important to think about how you might prove um, that your product is good, whatever that definition of good means. And creating data that proves your point requires a thoughtful and rigorous approach. It's important that you collect data that actually supports your point in a scientifically valid way. One of the other things to consider is that as a computing scientist, we have really a lot of power and responsibility in the age of big data. The skills that you will learn throughout your degree program make you uniquely qualified to gather data, to analyze data, and present results on data, um, which is a huge responsibility and something which must be done correctly. As we have seen uh, in recent events, as far as uh, contact tracing and the way that that data was processed and analyzed, you can see the impact that low data literacy can have, a very negative impact on, on society. So having a high level of data literacy is incredibly important as you join the workforce and complete your studies. Understanding how data is collected and analyzed will also just give you a better understanding of everything about the world around you. It will give you the authority and the experience to critique that data and to understand how conclusions have been drawn from that data and whether or not you agree with those conclusions. It's important to remember that even though we're talking about quantitative data, there's still a huge amount of interpretation and a huge amount of um, argumentation that is involved in actually putting together a coherent argument about what the results are. Even though it's quantitative, it is still subjective and still subject to interpretation how we choose to, to pull results out of data. So there's something interesting I, interesting I wanted to bring up when we talk about user studies and users. Uh, this is a quote from Edward Tufte, who is a famous uh, researcher in uh, computer visualization. Uh, and I wanted to bring this up as we start talking more and more about user experience and user studies. Only two industries refer to their customers as users, computer design and drug dealing. It's a kind of interesting perspective when we talk about users and user data, uh, that actually computing science is one of the few places where we talk about users in this way. So let's get into the details and let's start talking about data. So it's important to think about the different types of data that you might collect. I want to think about data in terms of continuous versus discrete data. And understanding the kind of data that you have uh, and how you are working with it is key to how you plan your analysis. It's important that you understand the type of data so you can perform the correct analysis. Applying the wrong method to the wrong data type will lead to invalid results. And that's a very easy way to have your argument completely fall apart when you're trying to demonstrate something using this data. So when we think about quantitative data, again, we have this spectrum of data. And on one side, we have very continuous data like task time. Time is a continuous uh, data, data type. Uh, and on the very other end, we have things like completion rate and conversion rate. These are discrete values that are a number between 1 and 100. And between all of that, we have a number of different types of data on a continuous spectrum. So we think about questionnaire data. Uh, we might have something that's uh, more uh, closer to continuous, depending on how we've uh, generated our scales. We might have something like the number of errors. So even though this is counted in rather discrete uh, buckets, there might not be uh, necessarily an obvious upper bound. So it's a little bit more continuous. Again, user assistance is something like that. The number of times we have to intervene and give user assistance is a discrete value, but doesn't necessarily have an upper bound. As where when we talk about completion rate, conversion rate, there is an upper bound. Um, so we have to think about what type of data that we have and what type of analysis it's going to support. So when we're considering this kind of spectrum of continuous versus discrete data, remember that discrete data has finite values or buckets. Uh, they're something that can be measured uh, in whole pieces. You can count them. 
continuous data uh, technically have a infinite number of steps which form a continuum. So something like time or reaction uh, time. Thinking about what type of data you have is important to understand what types of techniques you can use to analyze it and what types of insights that you can draw from it. And we'll talk a lot uh, about that a lot more as this lecture goes on. So once we've considered what type of data we're collecting, we need to also think about who we're collecting it from. So we often think about this in terms of populations and samples. Now the population refers to everyone in a given population. For example, if I wanted to know the height uh, of people in the CS1Q class, then if I wanted to do a population sample, I would need to pull every single person in this class. However, most often we have to think about samples. So this is a subset of the population, maybe a representative group. Um, and in this case, then it would be the average height of students in class right now. We often can't deal with the whole population. It's not feasible to get every single person uh, to participate in some kind of study or to provide this kind of data. So almost every time we talk about data, we're talking about a sample, a representative sample. Um, when we're doing a user study, maybe we recruit 20 people from the general population, and we're hoping that those results extrapolate out to the wider group. In almost every case, you'll be using sample data instead of population data. But it's important to recognize the limitations of using a sample uh, because of course we are making some assumptions that this uh, data generalizes to the population. So it's important to understand the constraints and restrictions of samples versus populations. When we think about the data, some of the first types of statistics that we might run on this are what we call descriptive statistics uh, and measuring the kind of central tendency. This is usually the first step in looking at the shape of a data set and trying to understand what the basic uh, structure of that data set is. So for this class, I expect you to understand mean, which is the average of the data set. Uh, this is a method of summarizing the middle value. I also expect you to know the median. And again, this is another way of describing uh, the central tendency, but in a different way. So median is the actual middle value of a data set. And this can be a good indicator of the center when we have asymmetric data sets or when outliers are going to pull that mean away from the actual center point of the data set. So often we will look at both of these and see if there's a huge uh, difference between them. What does that mean about the underlying data? And another metric that we would use to talk about uh, the central tendency is the standard deviation. So this measures the spread of data around the average. It's important not to confuse this with error in the data. This measures the kind of average distance of points away from the center, not how much noise is in the data set. Uh, so it's important to understand the difference uh, and to think about mean, median, and standard deviation and what this tells us about the shape of that data set. When we run an evaluation, we're often trying to prove something about uh, a product or system that we've created. The most common way of trying to do this proof is through hypothesis testing. We perform hypothesis testing to prove something measurable about a system we've created. And there's a few kind of key factors for how we uh, develop a hypothesis. First, you want to start with the key question that you're trying to answer. A very simple question, is A better than B? Once you know what you're trying to compare, consider how you're going to measure what better means. And it can mean a lot of different things. And we go through some examples, you'll see the range of the types of betters uh, that we try to measure when we're doing evaluations. So in this case, let's think, does A result in faster completion times than B? And finally, we need to phrase this as a falsifiable statement. Uh, and this is something that we'll talk about in a bit more detail, but you want to be able to create a statement that using a hypothesis test, you can actually prove whether it's true or false. And often we form this in the terms of a null hypothesis. So we say there is no difference between A and B. So why do we actually study things in terms of a null hypothesis? Um, and this goes down to the kind of very basics of uh, sci the scientific method. So imagine you're trying to prove the truth of one of the two uh, following statements. Every software project has bugs. Software projects never have bugs. It's very different when we try to prove these two statements uh, true or false. 
So every software project has bugs. To prove this true, we need to test every single software project, which is completely infeasible. There's no way that you could ever test every software project. But let's say we wanted to prove that uh, software projects never have bugs is false. This is quite easy. We only need to demonstrate that one project has a bug in it to prove this statement false. So in general, we might want to claim something like the first option. Every software project has bugs. This is probably true. Hard to prove though. But we know that we can easily prove the second option. So if we um, make our null uh, hypothesis, software projects never have bugs, we can prove that false and then make an argumentation that brings us somewhere closer to the first statement. But we're not going to be able to prove that first statement in any kind of scientifically valid way. So we make uh, our arguments in terms of null hypotheses, we disprove them, and then here comes the interpretation. We try to produce a good argument for why uh, we can move forward, for example, towards something like every software project has bugs. We can make some arguments if we can disprove the null hypothesis. Of course, if we're testing hypotheses, there's always scope for errors. Statistics can be erroneous. And we have to be very mindful of the impact of these errors on the results that we try to present. We can have what's called a type one error or a false positive. In this case, we're rejecting the null hypothesis when in reality it's true. These types of cases can be very hard uh, to detect and very hard to undo once those results have been published. We can also have something like a type two, a false negative. We might accept the null hypothesis when in reality it's false. In this case, additional scientific study can um, go on to prove that the, the thing we observed is actually there, but our previous tests were not sensitive enough to detect it. Both of these errors can be very problematic uh, in practice, and it's important to be mindful of the restrictions of, of hypothesis testing and statistics, because these types of errors uh, will occur. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to detect them. So. Once we've actually got an idea of what our hypothesis is, we need to actually design the experiment using independent and dependent variables to create that controlled comparison and actually try to infer a causal relationship. So we need to think, what are we interested in testing and what are we measuring? For comparisons to be valid, they must be controlled. We need to ensure that each comparison is incremental with a single point of variance. So if we have four conditions and each condition varies multiple variables at a time, we're not gonna be able to infer any causal relationships. The differences we observe could be down to multiple factors and thus we can't really draw strong conclusions from the data. We need to be very careful that each comparison has a single point uh, of, of variance that then we can start to infer those causal relationships. Again, we'll look at some practical examples of this to make it a bit clearer. But in general, I expect you, when looking at an experimental design, to be able to identify the independent variable and the dependent variable. The independent variable is the um, changes that are manipulated by the experimenter. And again, these should be very controlled for each condition. The dependent variable is what we're measuring. This is where we expect to see observable differences between the manipulations that we have uh, controlled. So the dependent variables can be a little bit broader. We might be looking in multiple places for where we might expect to observe changes, but the independent variables need to be heavily controlled and very tightly uh, controlled between uh, each condition. Finally, we also need to think about how we're going to structure the protocol for subjects. And this typically refers to whether we're using within subjects or between subjects. When we're looking at within subjects, we look at uh, designs where each participant completes all the conditions. So in this case, a participant would be seeing every single controlled change. We also sometimes run studies with a between subjects protocol. So in this case, each participant only completes one conditions and the comparisons are done in those participant groups. 